Okay, welcome everyone to the Tut Colloquium. Uh, today we have Peter Selinger, who is a professor of mathematics at Dalhousie University. Um, Peter uh, graduated from the University of Pennsylvania in 1997 and went on to positions at Aarhus University, University of Michigan, and Stanford uh, before landing in Canada and Ottawa, and then moving to his current position at uh, Dalhousie. Peter works in uh, mathematical methods in computer science, uh, notably in category theory, and more recently in the application of algebraic number theory in uh, quantum computation and compiling of quantum circuits. Uh, and today he'll tell us about uh, number theoretic methods in quantum computing. Peter. Okay, thank you, David. So, um, yeah, so th this work I'm gonna tell you about is actually something like almost, uh, I think it's seven years old. So I guess when giving a colloquium, one has a choice between talking about the most recent research or the most fun research. So this is definitely the most fun thing, I think, that, that I can talk about. Um, if any of you have seen this before, then I apologize. But anyway, so it's mostly for the people who haven't seen it before, I guess. Uh, and it's, it's about, uh, well, number theoretic methods in quantum computing. So <clears throat> Uh, classical computers manipulate bits and quantum computers manipulate quantum bits and you will not actually have to know very much about quantum bits for this talk except the few things that I'm going to tell you about. So we're going to be working um, with the groups SO3 and SU2. Okay, So SO3 is the group of rotations of three-dimensional space. So uh, an example of a rotation would be a uh, 90 degree rotation about the Z axis, okay? And of course, uh, you can compose these rotations. So if I do this one, two, three, four times, I get back to the identity, right? Which is where I started from. And um, you can also do a 90 degree rotation about the X axis or a 90 degree rotation about the Y axis. So I guess the X one is the white one, the Z is the yellow and the Y is the green, right? Uh, in, in this orientation. And all these 90 degree rotations that I've talked about so far are symmetries of the cube, right? Because each of them just leaves the, the set of faces of the cube basically invariant, right? It might uh, permute the faces, but it, it doesn't move a face to a place where there wasn't a face before. So these are the symmetries of the cube, and there's 24 of those. So it's a finite group. What's, what, in other words, what's generated by these 90 degree rotations is a finite group, okay? So we can call these rotations uh, maybe Sx for 90 degree rotation about the x-axis and y and z, right? But now if you start adding 45 degree rotations, so one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, Okay, that's a 45 degree rotation. You can do that about any of the axes, x, y, and z. If you start adding the 45 degree rotations and you take the entire group spanned by those, that's no longer a finite group. Okay, so with 45 degree rotations, you can very quickly get, you know, move basically anywhere almost, right? So the if you look at the subgroup of SO3 that's spanned by 45 degree rotations about the X, Y, and Z axes, then that's a dense subgroup of SO3. You can get, it's pretty easy to see that you can get within epsilon of just any arbitrary rotation of space. For example, if you do something like um, <clears throat> ZX, then that, that composed rotation turns out to be, um, it, it, you know, like every rotation of three dimensional space, it has some axis somewhere, and then it's an irrational rotation about that axis. By irrational, I mean some irrational multiple of pi. So if you just kind of keep, if you just keep going, you know, uh, tz, tx, tz, tx, tz, tx, you will never get back to the place that you started. Okay, so. And once you have an irrational rotation about some axis, then you can 
basically get arbitrarily close to any rotation about that axis. And then when you have it for two axes, then you can get arbitrarily close to any, any rotation of space, right? So that's, that's, that's the reason that you get a dense subgroup of SO3 here. And now an interesting problem is, you know, take some, take some arbitrary position of this cube, and then you can ask basically two questions. You can ask, uh, if you know the exact matrix of this rotation, right, you can ask, is it possible to actually get to this, get to this position from, you know, uh, just using these generators, right? And then you can ask, um, how do you actually find the generators? Like, how do you actually find the, the word the word in the generator that's going to get you to this position, say. So, so I could, you know, in my little app here, I could try to undo the rotations, right, until I get back to the identity. And that's, that turns out to be a priori a really difficult problem. Okay. Um, so, uh, in quantum computing, we're actually interested in unitary two by two matrices rather than real orthogonal three by three matrices, but they're almost the same thing because the group SO3 and SO2 are almost isomorphic. Okay, so um, uh, it's one of these special isomorphisms. Um, <clears throat> in fact, SO3, I think, is isomorphic to SU2 times SU1 or something like that. So basically up to a global, up to a, if you take the complex matrices modulo a scalar, then they're exactly isomorphic to SO3. So, so we're really interested in two by two matrices, but for pictures, you know, we use the three by three real ones because they're easier to understand. Um, oh, I forgot to say, um, one of the symmetries of the cube is a 180 degree rotation about the, about the axis that's halfway between the white and yellow faces. So that's basically the rotation that's gonna swap the white and the yellow face. And in quantum computing, that one is called the Hadamard gate. So it's usually called H, but you can get that also from 90 degree rotations, right? So if you do um, Z, Z, um, if you do Z, Z, what is it? Z, Z, Y, I think, let's try that again. Rotate about, so S, Z, S, Z, S, Y. That is also that same rotation, right? And conversely, if you have the H, then you only need, say, a 90 degree rotation about the Z axis, and you can then also automatically get a 90 degree rotation about the X axis, because you can just switch the X axis and the Z axis, then do your 90 degree rotation and then switch them back, right? And, and so the, the group that's spanned by, by these three matrices here is the same as the group that's spanned by just H and S. Okay, and if you add, if we add the 45 degree rotation, then we call that uh, T, okay? And so th these are the sort of um, uh, operations that, that are relevant for our quantum computing application. So in quantum computing, we work over SU2, and then whatever is spanned by H and S is called the Clifford operators, and whatever is spanned by H, S, and T is called the Clifford plus T operators. And here are the actual matrices uh, here now written uh, as elements of SU2. So these are complex two by two matrices. Okay, it turns out um, the reason these particular unitary matrices are relevant in quantum computing is when you build a fault tolerant quantum computer, it's going to have unitary operations built in. And most people think that it's going to have these Clifford operations built in because basically all of the error correcting codes for quantum computing that are known, maybe not all of them, but the majority of them have the property that they're really easy to do for Clifford gates and they're really hard, much harder to do for non-Clifford gates. Okay, so the reason we call this, this group Clifford plus T is that in some sense, the Clifford gates are going to be really cheap to perform on a quantum computer, but this T gate is going to be really expensive on a quantum computer. And that's also the reason I included S and T as separate generators. One is a 90 degree rotation and the other one a 45 degree rotation, even though S is equal to T squared, because S 
doing an S is really cheap and doing two T's is really expensive. So uh, we often want to count how many T's do we need to, to achieve a certain task. And of course, then it makes sense to have S as a separate generator there. Okay. So, uh, so the, the two problems that one could consider are the exact synthesis problem and the approximate synthesis problem. So by the exact synthesis problem, I mean, give me some unitary operator, let's say two by two, and suppose that it's guaranteed to be in the Clifford plus T group, then the exact synthesis problem is just to find a word in those generators that's actually equal to that operator, okay? And the approximate synthesis problem is, given any arbitrary operator u, whether or not it's in the Clifford plus T group, and an epsilon greater than zero, then find uh, a word in the generators that, so that's then equal to uh, that particular u you know, within epsilon. And we would like, so in, in quantum computing, they call these words in generators circuits, right? And we want these circuits to be ideally short, right? Uh, um, and we also want to be able to compute. Okay. Um, so this problem is actually quite old and it was considered very hard for basically all of its existence. So the number theorists like Lubotsky, Phillips, and Sarnak looked at this in the 1980s. Um, they actually were able to prove that if you want to approximate some operator up to epsilon, then you can always find a word of length O of one, O of log of one over epsilon. So if epsilon is, let's say, 10 to the minus 100, um, then you, you should expect to find a word of you know, roughly length 100. Well, it's O of 100, so some constant times 100, right? But the proof that they gave is not constructive. They used, um, I think, the Riemann hypothesis or something to prove it. So that means even though short words exist to get you into a given epsilon ball, no one really knew how to find such a word at all. And um, uh, then in quantum computing, Solovey and Katayev had this algorithm from the 90s where they don't do it in O of log of one over epsilon, but some power of log of one over epsilon. So I think it's something like the, uh, the C, I think is equal to 3.97 or something like that. So instead of getting 100 gates, maybe they got 100 to the fourth, which is uh, you know more gates, but still somewhat okay, I guess, uh, because it's only a power and not exponentially many gates. And then it's, but the, the point is that unlike Lubotsky, Phillips, and Sarnak, they described an actual algorithm by which you can actually describe a word that gives you an operator in that given epsilon ball. And then it wasn't clear for many years whether one can actually do better, right? In fact, it was considered, that this was considered a difficult problem. And in 2008, a group of researchers uh, with Kirsten Lauder actually proposed a cryptographic hash algorithm whose difficulty was based on the difficulty of this problem, okay? And then later that year, they broke their own cryptographic hash algorithm. So, so in fact, um, we, they did this over the p-adic numbers rather than the real numbers. So no one noticed for maybe 10 more years that they had actually done, done the same thing. But in fact, they solved the problem that, that I'm going to describe uh, four years or five years before we did, but they did it in this cryptographic setting where it wasn't at all obvious. You know, with hindsight, it's obvious that it's basically the same method for solving the same problem, but it wasn't obvious at the time. Right, and, uh, and then I'm gonna tell you about how we did that. So just to give you an idea, I mean, um, I'm sure you all agree with me that good algorithms come from good mathematics, okay? So I'm putting that here as a slogan. Um, both the solvey kitaev algorithm and these new number theoretic algorithms, they each come from interesting mathematics, but the mathematics is quite different. So the solvey kitaev algorithm is based on ideas from geometry. Basically, what you do is 
you know, imagine you're walking around on some manifold. Okay, so SO3 is a three-dimensional manifold, but just imagine you're walking around on a two-dimensional manifold, like the surface of the Earth, right? And now you're standing at the at some place in Waterloo, and you're taking you're going one meter north, right? And then you are turning 90 degrees and you walk one meter in that direction and you turn 90 degrees and you walk one meter in that direction and you turn 90 degrees and walk one meter in that direction. And the question is, do you come, you know, are you going to end up in exactly the same place that you started? And of course, the answer is no, because the earth is curved. I mean, the curvature is very slight, but it's nevertheless curved. So you're going to end up within an epsilon of the place that you started. So basically, if if going north is A and going south is A inverse and going east is B and going west is B inverse, then if you perform an operation of the form A, B, A inverse, B inverse, it's not quite the identity, right? Because the group is not quite commutative, it's just very close. Uh, but the epsilon is very small. That means if you know how to approximate something to within one meter, then by using this trick, you can also approximate it within epsilon, okay? It turns out this epsilon, the size of this epsilon, is proportional to the area that you just surrounded. So, so it's approximately, you know, one square meter compared to the surface of the entire Earth. That is sort of the order of magnitude that your epsilon will be. So it'll be, it'll be that sort of fraction roughly uh, of one meter. Okay. So, and then you can iterate this trick. So if you know how to take a step of size epsilon, then you can do and you call one of those steps, say C, then you can do C, D, C inverse, D inverse, and you get something, a step of size epsilon squared, all right? So by using this, this sort of um, uh, commutator trick, you can, uh, uh, you can walk into arbitrarily small epsilon balls. And that's basically the solvay kataev algorithm. Now you can also see why the words that you get are a little bit longer then is maybe optimal, right? Because if you do A, B, A inverse, B inverse, in order to go from epsilon to epsilon squared, right? Then if you want to go to epsilon to the 100th, um, you need to iterate this, uh, you know, several more times. And each time you double the precision, you've made the word four times longer, right? Actually, you made it five times longer, not four times, because you first have to t take some steps to go near the epsilon ball, right? And then you take several steps of this kind to sort of move around in the epsilon ball. So, so that's where the exponent in the solvay kataev algorithm comes from. Each time you double the precision, you make the words more than twice as long. And now this, this algorithm I'm gonna to describe today is based on a completely different idea. There's no geometry in this algorithm, but it's completely based on number theory. And it turns out that we can, we can uh, get an exponent of one, okay? But so there's actually two kinds of number theory that we need to solve this problem. Uh, we're gonna have to solve a Diophantine equation and we're going to have to solve a grid problem, okay? So uh, let's talk about each of these things in turns. Oh, this little slide just shows um, how many gates you get to go into a given epsilon ball. So with the, for example, if you want 10 to the minus 100 for your precision, then with solvay kataev that would be 37 million gates. And with this new number theoretic algorithm, just under 1,000, okay? All right, we have to solve a Diophantine equation. We have to solve an integer lattice problem. And then there's some other ingredients that, that we're going to see. So let's talk about some number theory. And when I say number theory, I mean undergraduate number theory, like some second year course number theory, okay? Not, I'm not talking about complicated things, just the sort of thing, you know, that, that, uh, that you can understand um, even if you haven't seen much number theory. So there's a very classic question. This is actually 300 years old. So Fermat asked, which integers can be written as a sum of two squares? Maybe, most of you know that every integer, every positive integer can be written as a sum of four squares, right? But not every integer can definitely be written as a sum of two squares. For example, seven cannot be written in that way, right? But five can. 
So, um, so Fermat wanted to know exactly which integers can be written as a sum of two squares. And it turns out that he was able to answer that question. Okay. Uh, here's an interesting um, uh, observation, which is if n and m each can be written as a sum of two squares, then n times m can also be written as a sum of two squares. Okay. Uh, and that would be, it's not, if you just think about that question uh, and you write, you know, n equals a squared plus b squared and then m equals c squared plus d squared, you can find some formula for n m, right? It's a squared c squared plus whatever. And then it's not immediately obvious. Well, it's immediately obvious that that's the sum of four squares, but then you can refactor it in some clever way, you know, completing several squares. And, you know, you can find a formula for explicitly writing n m as a sum of two squares. And it would be a sort of interesting exercise, I guess, for someone to figure that out. But the nice thing is, as soon as you move to the complex numbers, the problem becomes completely trivial. Because a real number can be written as a sum of two squares. And I'm talking of squares of integers, obviously, here. A real number can be written as a sum of two squares. a squared plus b squared is, if and only if it can be written as z times the conjugate of z, right, where z is some Gaussian integer, because a plus bi times a minus bi is, is a sum of two squares. And then it's immediately clear that the product of two Gaussian integers is a Gaussian integer. So, so therefore, if n is of that form and m is of that form, then n times m is of that form, right? So with the complex numbers, it's immediately obvious, where maybe in the real numbers, it wasn't. All right. So the first lesson of number theory is you learn more about the integers by moving to a larger ring, in this case, the Gaussian integers. Um, but what about the converse? If n times m can be written as a sum of two squares, uh, do we know that n and m individually can be written as a sum of two squares? Well, obviously it's false in general. For example, seven times seven is a square, right? So it can be written as zero squared plus seven squared, but seven itself cannot be written as a sum of two squares, right? Um, which you can prove by case distinction, I guess. So, but the, what is true is if n and m are relatively prime, meaning that their GCD is equal to one, then that statement is actually true. Okay, so it's a kind of converse to our first theorem. And interestingly, it's not that difficult to prove. Maybe you've seen this proof before, maybe you haven't, right? So suppose that n times m can be written as a sum of two squares. And we know we could express that in the, in the Gaussian integers like that. Now it turns out the Gaussian integers are Euclidean domain. So that means we can take greatest common divisors in there. Not only greatest common divisors, we can also do things like Bezu's identity, right? Which sort of comes from Euclid's algorithm. So just take the greatest common divisor of n and a plus bi. I mean, notice up here that there is a number, namely n times m, which we have written as a product in two different ways, right? On the one hand, n times m, on the other hand, a plus bi times a minus bi. Now, because the Gaussian integers are Euclidean domain, you have unique factorization in there. That means each of these products can be unique, each number can be un uniquely factored into a product of Gaussian primes. I mean, not quite uniquely, I mean, uniquely in the, in the way, you know, up to a unit of the ring. And that means if we look at this GCD, that's gonna give us all the factors that n and this number here have in common. If we look at this other GCD, it's gonna give us the common factors of m and this number, right? And then you get two complex numbers and it's not hard to show that in this case, n is equal to t times t dagger. By the way, I'm using physicist notation here. So um, physicists write dagger for the complex conjugate for some reason. All right, so I'm doing this here. And, and m is this other thing. And, uh, and then we're done, right? Because we've written n and m each as a sum of two squares. Uh, the point here is that t and s are Gaussian integers because the entire GCD is computed in the ring of Gaussian integers. 
Okay, so that's the converse. So the second lesson of number theory is the fact that some ring is a Euclidean domain uh, is very helpful because then you can compute stuff. Uh, by the way, this proof here is completely constructive because not only do GCDs exist in the Gaussian integers, but they're also really, really efficient to compute. Just like Euclid, Euclid's algorithm is efficient in the integers, it's also efficient in the Gaussian integers. So that means you can actually, given the n and the m and the a and the b, you can actually calc, you can actually find, you have an algorithm to actually find the way that n and m are written as sums of two squares. All right. So that so because of these theorems we just proved, the question whether some integer can be written as a sum of two squares reduces to the same question just for primes, right? Because you know, if you write the integer as a product of prime powers, then you know the whole integer can be written as a sum of two squares if and only if each of the prime powers can be written as a sum of two squares. Now, if the prime power is even, then that's trivial because it's already a square. And if the prime power is odd, then it turns out that the, the prime power can be written as a sum of two squares if and only if the underlying prime can be so written, right? So we only need to really consider the question for the primes. Obviously, you have to have a positive prime because negative primes can't be written as a sum of squares. And here's a list, right, of the first so many primes. Uh, all the ones that can be written as a sum of two squares, I have done so. And the ones that can't be written, well, like seven and 11, I just wrote a, line, a horizontal line. And then the question is, what's the pattern here, right? Well, <clears throat> the pattern is, if you look at the prime modulo four, then if it's congruent to three mod four, then it cannot be written as a sum of two squares. And if it's congruent to one mod four, then it can, okay? So that's actually uh, Fermat's theorem of the sum of two squares. A prime can be written as a, an odd prime can be written as a sum of two squares if and only if it's congruent to one mod four. And of course, there would be many modern proofs of this using quadratic reciprocity or whatever, but uh, I don't actually know how Fermat proved it. But uh, since it's not difficult to prove, we will just prove it quickly, I think. So first, the, the only if direction is the easier one. Um, every square is always congruent to zero or one modulo four because there are only four of those squares, right? Zero squared is zero, one squared is one, two squared is zero, three squared is one. And therefore the sum of two squares can only be zero, one, or two modulo four, definitely cannot be congruent to three modulo four, right? So that proves, for example, that seven cannot be written as a sum of two squares, nor can any number prime or not, any number that's congruent to three mod four cannot be written as a sum of two squares. But what about the converse? So he proved this, um, what is it now? more than 260 years ago, right? A positive odd prime can be written as a sum of two squares if and only if it's congruent to one mod four. And for us, it's gonna be important, not just that this theorem is true, but there is actually an efficient algorithm for computing the two num, you know, for computing how P can be written as a sum of two squares. Um, so rather than describing the proof, I'm just gonna describe the algorithm which sort of contains the proof you know, within it. So given a P such that P is congruent to one, by Fermat's little theorem, we have that X to the P minus one is congruent to one mod P for all X, right? I mean, for all non-zero X. Uh, uh, what I mean is all non-zero x in the integers modulo p, right? So there's p minus one of those. So this is a polynomial equation of degree p minus one, and it has p minus one roots, right? That's the maximal number of roots that it can have because it's of degree p minus one and the integers mod p do form a field. So, so uh, an nth degree polynomial can have at most n roots in there. So if you, but P minus one is even, right? Uh, so if you compute X to the P minus one over two, 
that's a number whose square is equal to one, right, mod p. So because it's a field, that number must be plus or minus one. Because again, x squared equals one, that equation can have only two solutions and plus and minus one are the two solutions, right? So every x to the p minus one over two is equal to plus or minus one. But in fact, exactly half of the x's must give you plus one and exactly the other half must give you minus one. Why? Because every x is a root of this equation, but at most p minus one over two x's can be a root of this equation, right? Again, because it's a polynomial equation. And at most p minus one over two can be a root of this equation. And we have a total of p minus one roots, so exactly half of them must be, must be one and half must be the other, right? And now we're gonna find an x such that x to the p minus one over two is congruent to negative one mod p. This is very easy to do by a probabilistic algorithm because you just pick the x at random. Pick a random x, a random non-zero x. Now, we just proved that with probability 50%, you've solved the equation, right? And with probability 50%, you haven't. So you just keep repeating it with a random x and very soon you'll find a solution there, right? And so that's the only part of the algorithm that's probabilistic. The rest is completely uh, deterministic. So once you have this x, uh, you raise it to the power p minus one over four, which you can do because p is congruent to one mod four. So p minus one over four is still an integer. And then h squared is congruent to minus one mod p. So p is a divisor of h squared plus one. So p is a divisor, this should be divisor. P is a divisor of this product here. Right, and then you can take the GCD of p and that, and one of those two factors, and you get a complex number. And it's a very short argument, which I'm going to skip, but there's an easy argument that shows in this case, p is actually equal to, you know, because you could take the, the GCD of p with h plus i, or the GCD of p with h minus i, and the product of those two GC, because h plus i and h minus i are relatively prime, the product of those GCDs has to be p. Okay, and, and that, so then you have written p as a sum of two squares and you have an algorithm to do it. Okay, any questions up to this point? Okay, well, if there are no questions, we'll move on to grid problems. So that's gonna be the second ingredient, okay, in, in, in these number theoretic algorithms. Uh, we already talked about the Gaussian integers. So the Gaussian integers is the smallest subring of the complex numbers that contains the integers, obviously, and also i, right? And here is the ring z root two, which is very similar to the Gaussian integers, except in, a, in instead of adding a square root of minus one, we're adding a square root of two to the integers. So the smallest subring of the complex numbers containing z and root two. And all the elements in there are of the form a plus b root two, where a and b are integers, because that's closed under addition, subtraction, and multiplication. Not division, so it's not a field, right? But it's a ring. And just like the Gaussian integers, this ring has a form of conjugation. It's not complex conjugation, but it's root two conjugation where you uh, replace root two by minus root two, and that's an automorphism of the ring. And moreover, um, every, uh, what, if you take any element alpha of that ring and you multiply alpha by alpha bullet, you always get an integer, okay? Uh, so something that doesn't have a root two in it, and that's called the algebraic norm of alpha. Okay, so how should we think of this ring z root two? Well, it's dense in the real numbers. Um, that's not so hard to see, right? Because root two is irrational. So you can approximate any real number as close as you want by a number of the form a plus b root two, where a and b are integers. But it turns out that thinking of this as a dense set in the real numbers, we kind of don't see very much there 
like there's just too, it looks like the real numbers there's just too many points there but what you can do is uh you can tease this apart a little bit so each of these black dots here should be projected onto the diagonal line right to get the dense set that we just saw a second ago but when you tease it apart a little a little you see that it's actually a a grid right so I've written the A component. So remember that A is an integer and B is an integer. So this number has an A component and a B root two component. And if you plot them separately, then you get this nice little grid, but the actual number alpha, which is A plus B root, plus B root two would be uh, what happens if you project this entire grid onto, the, onto this diagonal axis. So we should think of Z root two as a discrete set rather than a dense set. We should give it a topology, you know, where, where these points are all uh, discrete. And what you can also do is you can project onto the opposite diagonal. Then you get another way of thinking of Z root 2 as a dense subset of the real numbers. And in this case, it corresponds to the number A minus B root 2. So the automorphism we talked about on the previous slide, which maps A plus B root 2 to A minus B root 2, could actually be understood as you take a point in this dense set, you sort of unproject it, right? And then you project it onto the opposite axis. So that automorphism is extremely non-continuous. So a function is continuous if it maps nearby points to nearby points. And this bullet function exactly never does that. It can never happen that alpha and beta in the ring Z root two are close to each other, but alpha and alpha bullet and beta bullet are also close to each other, unless they're zero, right? I mean, if alpha is equal to beta, then, then this happens, but you cannot have points that are non-trivially close to each other and their bullets also. And the reason, the proof is very simple, right? Because if that difference is A plus B root two, then, then the difference between these points is a minus b root 2 and a plus b root 2 times a minus b root 2 is always an integer and if it's a non-zero integer then it's got to be at least one that means the product of this distance and this distance is always greater or equal one unless alpha is equal to beta so if alpha minus beta is very small then alpha bullet minus beta bullet is very large and that makes sense because the topology induced by, I mean, if you think of this norm and that norm, you know, you have two points, alpha and beta, you know, one of them is the projection onto this axis and the other is the projection onto this axis. And because it's a grid in the two dimensional space that's discrete, they can't both be small, right? That would be sort of a geometric way of seeing that. So the third lesson of number theory is pay attention to the automorphisms of the ring, right? Because this bullet automorphism, um, that was actually useful for, for something, right? Uh, it's gonna become more useful in a, in a second. Now, what is it? what do I mean by a grid problem? Um, let B be a set of real numbers. Okay, you know, like actual real numbers, like let's say maybe an interval, okay? Then the grid for B, is the set of all those alpha in Z root two, so that alpha bullet is an element of B. So in some sense, it's the dual of the set B. For example, if B is the interval from minus one to one, then, uh, well, alpha equals zero is in that set. Alpha equals one is in that set. Here you have um, one plus root two. So one plus root two is in the grid because one minus root two is in the, in the green set. And then here you have uh, two plus root two, two plus two root two, three plus two root two, and so on. Okay, um, what can we say about this grid? First of all, if I make the set B larger, then the grid becomes denser because there are gonna be more points that are in the, in the green set. Um, the, another thing I can say about the grid is it's infinite. Th this definitely continues infinitely in both directions because Z root two is dense, right? 
So there exist infinitely many alphas in that set. And then their bullets are grid points. So it's definitely infinite. It has some other interesting properties. For example, um, you can show that there's only finitely many distances between these points that are possible. In fact, there's only three distances that are possible. One, root two, and I think one plus root two. No, uh, no, that's not right. One, uh, well, it depends what the set B is, okay? For this set B, the distances are a bit different than, than that set B. So here it's one root two and one plus root two is what the possible distances are. If the set B, if the interval gets larger, the distances get smaller, but there's only finitely many possible distances between adjacent points, which is not hard to prove. And the set is also, um, what did Penrose call that? Quasi-periodic. That means if you look at any finite pattern of adjacent points, you're going to find infinitely many copies of that pattern everywhere on this grid. Okay. And, and they're also going to be relatively evenly distributed. Okay, and then a one dimensional grid problem is find the intersection of this grid, you know, the grid, calculate the grid for a green set and then find the intersection of that and another set. So given two sets A and B, find all the numbers alpha in this ring such that alpha is in the set A and alpha bullet is in the set B. Or equivalently, find the intersection of the grid for B with the interval A. So in this particular problem, there would be four solutions because there are four grid points in this interval. And there's always gonna be, if both sets are intervals, there's always gonna be finitely many solutions because, you know, because the grid is discrete. Okay, so <clears throat> solving these grid problems in many cases is easy. If we think of this geometrically, if my, if my set A and my set B are given and they're intervals, right? And I think of a number of the form A plus B root two, then to say that that number is in the set A means in this two dimensional picture, the point should be between these two parallel lines, right? So that the projection onto the main diagonal would be you know, in that interval A. And for the bullet to be in the set B means it should be between these two lines, right? So what I'm really doing is I'm finding the intersection of a convex set, in this case, a rectangle, with, with what's basically um, an integer grid, or in this case, a sort of distorted integer grid. And that's a pretty easy problem to solve most of the time. Namely, uh, what do you do? You, A and B are given, right? So probably the endpoints are given. So you calculate the coordinates of this point and of this point. That gives you sort of finitely many a coordinates, right? And then, you know, you look at each possible integer a between these two, between these two coordinates, and you and you check if there are any y's, you know, if there are any points above that that are in that rectangle. So in in the case where both intervals are relatively large, it's very easy to find uh, these grid solutions. But the problem is not quite so trivial if one of the intervals is tiny and the other one is very large, like in this example here. So imagine that the, the size of this little interval here is really some epsilon, you know, very, very small. Now the method I just described for finding the grid problems doesn't work. Like it works, but it's not efficient, right? Because you're gonna look for all the integers between this point and this point, but there's going to be very many, right? And then you're going to iterate through all of these integers and check whether there's sort of a grid point above it that falls into this set. But of course, most of them don't. So um, it's going to take O of one over epsilon steps to go through all of these grid points. And you're extremely unlike, you know, it's going to take you a long time before you find an actual solution. So how, but it turns out we can solve these grid problems efficiently anyway. And the answer is scaling. So the ring Z root two has a unit. So in any ring, a unit is just an invertible element. 
right? It turns out that one plus root two times one minus root two is negative one. So that means one plus root two times this number here is equal to one. That means um, both this lambda and its inverse are elements of the ring z root two. And what, oops, sorry. And what we can do is, you know, take, take a grid problem. Uh, so what's the grid problem? We're looking for an alpha so that alpha is in one set and alpha bullet is in the other set. Then what I can do is just multiply both equations by lambda, sorry, lambda bullet alpha bullet, multiply the first equation by, by lambda and the second equation by lambda bullet and call that thing beta. Right, so the grid problem for A and B is completely equivalent to the grid problem for lambda A and lambda bullet B. Meaning if I can find the beta, then I can just divide it by lambda and I get the alpha and vice versa, right? But lambda is one plus, lambda is one plus square root of two. So uh, that's, you know, 2.4 2 or something. So definitely greater than one, but lambda bullet is one minus root two, so that's less than one. The absolute value of that is less than one. That means if I can make the set A fatter, I can simultaneously make the set B skinnier. So if we apply this trick, so I apply by, I multiply by lambda, and then I do it again, the set A will get fatter and fatter, and the set B will get smaller and smaller, and after some number of iterations, I'm again in the case that's easy to solve. And now you can see there are actually three solutions here to my grid problem, right? And you can then just translate these solutions back. There's one, two, three, and back to this situation, there are one, two, three solutions, okay? So the simple scaling trick lets you solve the grid problems efficiently. And that's the fourth lesson of number theory. Use the units of the ring, okay? In this case, this unit lambda equals one plus root two. Okay, so we have an efficient algorithm for solving one-dimensional grid problems. We have an efficient algorithm for certain Diophantine equations. And now we also, I actually am gonna need to solve two-dimensional grid problems, but I'll just show you this quickly. And then I'll just mention that the algorithm is basically the same, just using the complex numbers instead of the real ones. So in the complex number, okay, because the matrices that we started with at the beginning of the talk, whoops, uh, these matrices here, they were all, um, all the entries of these matrices are from the ring. Peter, that, there's yeah. a question from the chat. So Anurag Manchu yeah. asks, uh, does it change the runtime like this transformation of scaling? No. So the runtime is, uh, the, the scaling, you see, if epsilon is 10 to the minus 1000, you just need to scale it O of 1000 times, right? So, so that's, it's basically polynomial in uh, the log of epsilon, right? So that's, that turns out to be extremely fast in any sort of, application. Okay, all the, the ring that we're actually interested in is Z omega. And the reason is that all the entries, all the entrant, all the entries of these matrices are from that ring. I don't have an efficient way of going back to the, oh dear, <laughs> going back to the page where I was. Uh, so two, you know, just to, so omega is, uh, the number on the complex unit circle that is at 45 degrees. So that's e to the i pi over four. And uh, you could also write that as one plus i over root two. And z omega is a sub ring of the complex numbers, which is very analogous to the way that z root two is a sub ring of the, of the integers, okay, of the real numbers. So, and again, you have an automorphism in there and, um, 
and uh, you know, given a convex subset, given a green convex subset of the complex numbers, you can define its grid, and it's again one of these quasi-periodic sets. And then the grid problem is uh, is exactly the same as before. So, given a red and a green set, find the intersection there. And I will mention because it's fun that Penrose tilings are of this form. I don't know if you know this. So I mentioned quasi-periodic sets, right? But if you take if you take a fifth root of unity instead of an eighth root of unity, and you look at that subring of the complex numbers, which also has a non-trivial automorphism, then if you look at the grid of a convex set, sorry, if you look at the grid of a, doesn't have to be convex. If you look at the grid of a set, uh, maybe compact set, okay, then it's going to turn out to be one of these quasi-periodic um, subsets of the complex numbers. You can take these points as the sort of corner points of a tiling, and then you get, and the Penrose tilings actually arise in this way. Uh, there's the kite and dagger tiling, there's this tiling here, but Penrose actually made a lot of different tilings. These are just, this left one is better known than this right one, but um, they're all sort of of the same kind. And the point is that you only have finitely many tiles. And it's not periodic, but it's quasi-periodic. And here, so this here is just the eighth root of unity version of that. So let me just tell you, uh, there's an efficient algorithm for also solving these two-dimensional grid problems. And in fact, the standard Lenstra, Lenstra, Lovac, uh, lattice algorithm would, for example, you could use that to solve this problem. All right. <clears throat> so, now we uh, gave you lots of ingredients from number theory. We're going to have to put these together now to get an algorithm for solving the problem that I promised I would solve. <clears throat> so consider the group, the subgroup of SU2 generated by these, <clears throat> by these four things here. There is a magical theorem by Matsumoto and Amano that says every Clifford plus T operator, well, obviously every Clifford plus T operator can be written of this form, where it's like a Clifford operator and then a T, and then a Clifford operator and a T, and a Clifford operator and a T, because that's by definition what a Clifford plus T operator is. But Matsumoto and Amano showed that every Clifford plus T operator has a unique canonical form. Every such operator can be uniquely written in this form. So this is a, uh, a regular expression, right? You have an optional T at the beginning, then any number of syllables that are either HT or SHT, and then a single Clifford operator at the end. That is a, a unique canonical form. Here's an example of such a form. And it also has some very nice properties. Uh, because we're gonna be interested in minimizing the number of Ts that a given operator uses, it turns out this Matsumoto Amano normal form always uses the smallest possible number of Ts. So that T count, in this case it's 11, is automatically the minimal that you can have for, you know, modulo the equations of the group. And another way of saying that is that the, the set of Clifford plus T operators actually has the structure of a regular tree. You start with the identity, then in the beginning you apply an optional T, and then any number of syllables that are either S, H, T, or H, T. So that lets you walk around on, on, this, on this infinite tree where every, uh, every vertex has degree three. Uh, and actually Jean-Pierre Serre wrote a book called Trees. That's the name of the book. And it's basically about the, all the number theoretic ramifications of, of this little observation here, much more generally and not just for the Clifford plus T group. Okay, so with this Matsumoto Amano result, we can immediately count the number of operators with a given T count. If you want to know how many Clifford plus T operators are there that are, you know, how many different ones are there of T count 11? Well, that's just the same as counting the number of words in this regular expression, right? And, and that's, that's always something that one can easily do. So it turns out there are exactly this many Clifford plus T operators of T count N and there are this many epsilon balls in my manifold because it's a three-dimensional manifold. So the volume of the epsilon ball is proportional to epsilon cubed, right? 
And because every epsilon ball has, to, you know, if I want to do the approximate synthesis problem, then I have to find an operator in each epsilon ball. I have this many operators of t count n and that many epsilon balls. So that means if I have to have one operator in each epsilon ball, the left-hand side is greater or equal to the right-hand side, which you can solve. And you find that the, the t count, the average case t count has to be at least three times log one over epsilon. And I didn't write O of log one over epsilon here because the constant is actually known, right? It's three, not just some arbitrary constant. And it comes from the fact that it's a three-dimensional manifold. And the log is in base two, not some, you know, not base 10 or base E or anything. It's base two, and that comes from the fact that there's a, uh, that each syllable is either uh, HT or SHT. So there are two syllables giving, you know, and that sort of determines how long the words have to be. And the other magical ingredient is that Klushnikov, Maslov, and Mosca, at least two of these people were at the time at the University of Waterloo. One of them still is. No, two, no, sorry, all three of them were at the time, and I think possibly two of them still are. Anyway, it's a Waterloo thing, right? So they proved that a unitary operator is a Clifford plus T operator, so writable in those generators, if and only if the entries are from this ring. Now, the only if direction is obvious because the generators are all from this ring. And by multiplying and adding, you can't leave the ring. So clearly, all Clifford plus T operators have entries in that ring. It's the converse that was really magical. That if, as long as the operator is unitary and the entries are from that ring, then it is in, then it's generated by those generators. And moreover, the T count, in this case, 11, uh, no, 12, I think, uh, the, the T count, whichever it is, is a function of the K that you get in the front of the matrix. So it always starts with one over root two to the K and then some matrix over that ring. And the T count is directly computer, it's directly related to that K. Okay. Peter, so um, yeah, go ahead. Oh, sorry to interrupt. On the previous slide, you had a formula for the, um, uh, which was, yes, K plus three, or sorry, in the corollary there, the capital K. Is that, um, Sarah Lee asks in the chat, is that a constant, that K? That K is 11. Okay, thank you. <laughs> I think, it's some small constant, yeah. But notice it's not, oh, I mean, it's not a multiplicative constant, just an additive one, right? So that's much, much more, gives you much more information than if it were big O notation. Right, so. Now we have all the ingredients, we just have to put them together, okay? Given an arbitrary operator u and an epsilon, find a Clifford plus t operator of small t count such that it's in that epsilon ball. That is the problem, right? And the way we're gonna solve it is, instead of an arbitrary operator, we're gonna only consider a diagonal operator. That's without loss of generality almost, because every arbitrary operator can be written as a product of three diagonal operators I mean, uh, uh, about different uh, bases, right? So that's um, Euler decomposition. You can, any arbitrary rotation is a rotation about the z-axis, x-axis, and z-axis. So if we can approximate diagonal operators, we can approximate everything. Now, given a diagonal operator, we're gonna approximate it by an operator of this form. For them to be close to each other up to epsilon, we need these numbers to be very close to zero. And this number u, to be very close to whatever it's supposed to be. But the beautiful thing is, if u is close to that number, then t is automatically close to zero. Because u squared plus t squared is one, right? Essentially, uh, up to the scalar in the front. So that means, all. so first we solve a grid problem. The grid problem is, find a u on the given grid, which is basically close to the, uh, you know, close to the u prime that we need. Uh, so, so it turns out in order for the operator to be epsilon close to the given operator, u has to lie in this region here, which is called a meniscus. Uh, a men it's called a meniscus if you, if you slice off a piece from a, from a disc like that. You also have a meniscus in your knee, which is, uh, which is a bone, I think, that has that shape, okay? Um, so find, find a u 
in that in that region here okay the region is is somehow uh the 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 width of this region is epsilon and once you have the u then you solve a Diophantine equation to find the t and no matter which t you find if you can find one at all it's going to be small enough that the equation that has to hold holds up to epsilon okay so what this does is it just neatly chops this problem into two into three pieces. The first is solve a grid problem. So we have an efficient algorithm for that. The second piece is solve the Diophantine equation. So we have an efficient algorithm for that. I did that for writing, I did that in the integers. So here we do it in, in, in Z omega, but it's, it's basically the same algorithm, okay? And then the third ingredient is once you have the matrix, you use Klushnikov, Maslow, and Mosca and Matsumoto Amano to find the shortest possible word, right? And you know what the length of that word is going to be because you know the K ahead of time. So you're gonna basically try for each K from one to infinity. And the first one for which you can solve the equation gives you the shortest possible Clifford plus T operator in that epsilon ball, okay? So uh, here's the result. Um, now it turns out to solve, remember that if we wanted to write some integer that wasn't a prime as a sum of two squares, then we had to factor that into prime first, into primes first. So it's the same with this Diophantine equation. If the right hand side isn't a, a prime, then you need to factor. So if you know how to factor, then the algorithm I just outlined will always find the optimal solution. Okay. Not just O of optimal, but actually optimal. It finds absolutely the shortest word that it's going to give you into the possible, into, into that epsilon ball for a diagonal operator. And if you don't have a factoring oracle, then you can, you're still almost optimal in the sense that you just O of log of log of one over epsilon worse than optimal. So if epsilon is 10 to the minus 1000, then log of log of one over epsilon is probably three or something. So that's, that's very, very close to optimal, right? And it, it, it turns out that uh, not, only, not only do you find a pretty good or op, you know, optimal or nearly optimal operator of t-count, even in the cases where you don't have a factoring algorithm, you find an upper bound and a lower bound for what the optimal t-count would have been. So, so you know how close to optimal you are. And the whole algorithm is ridiculously efficient runs in time log of one over epsilon. So that's, he, here's the numbers again, right? What the, pre, what the geometric algorithms do, what the number theoretic algorithms do for these given epsilons, uh, you know, what the lower bound is and what the algorithm actually computes. So for example, we found an operator of t count 1000. We can prove that there isn't one of t count less than 998. So it's within two of optimal, right? And, and you know, similar for these other numbers here. So before, so we finished, right? I just want to show you the algorithm actually running. Use the same information in pictures, uh, some references, whoa. Let me just, before we, we're a few minutes over, but let, let me just show you the, the algorithm, like just so you can appreciate how fast it is. Give me an angle. Someone tell me an angle, any angle. 73, 73 degrees. 73 degrees. Okay, so I have to translate that to radians. So that's over 100 and times pi, right? And let's approximate that up to the, so that, that rotation about the z-axis by that angle, I'm gonna approximate it as a Clifford plus t operator up to epsilon equals 10 to the minus 100. Here's the operator, okay? Did you see how fast that just was? It was like maybe a third of a second or something. So it's SHT, SHT, HT, SHT, right? That's just the regular expression. And, and at the very end, a Clifford operator. Okay, so I'm gonna do dash S so we see some more information. Here's the operator. So it's in that epsilon ball, right? Here's the precision that we requested, 10 to the minus 100. Here's the actual precision, the actual distance between the operator and, and, the, and the computed one. So it's, you can see it's slightly less than 10 to the minus 100. The runtime was about half a second. 
this is the actual matrix. Um, this is the T count of the operator that I computed up here. And this is the T count of the optimal operator, which in this case happens to be the same. And when we try to solve our Diophantine equation, we failed seven times. And typically this happens because I'm not able to factor the some integer into primes. So then I fail and I try the next candidate, right? Uh, sorry, two timed out, which means they couldn't be factored into primes. Seven failed, which means the Diophantine equation actually didn't have a solution, right? Like not every integer can be written as a sum of two squares. In this case also, not every equation has a solution. And then one succeeded. So that was the 10th one that, that was tried. That we, we tried 10 different u's and try to find the corresponding t. And because all 10 u's, if they had succeeded, would have given a t count of 100, uh, 1,000, we know that the, that the one we found was actually optimal. OK? That's it. OK, thank you very much. I can do 10 to the minus 1,000, but it's probably going to run about 40 seconds. <laughs> Questions? Uh, well, let's thank Peter for a very nice talk. Um, there was, uh, maybe to get us started with questions, I can just mention one question that was asked in the chat okay. uh, nearing the end. Uh, Puya Ronag asks, how do you establish a lower bound on the T count? Right, so um, that's related to the way that the algorithm works. So I didn't describe very much in much, you know, I sort of skipped this part a little bit and I'm not gonna go into it now, but, um, what, remember how we had sort of dissected the problem into two parts. Uh, so I should, I should probably be more, slightly more precise about this. So when we want to, what we want is, sorry, I, I wrote too much on these slides. Let me just erase. Uh, we want these two matrices to be close to each other, right? And we want the K to be as small as possible. So these two matrices should be within epsilon of each other, but the k should be as small as possible. So for any given k, like k equals 10, for example, and the reason we want the k to be small is because the t count is gonna be exactly a function of k. It's like 2k minus two or something like that, right? Um, so for a given k, like k equals 10, it may or may not be possible to find such an operator in that epsilon ball. So the way you decide whether it's possible or not is you first have to find a U that's in a certain region of space and on a grid. And the size of this grid somehow is a function of K. And the size of the region is a function of epsilon. So if K is large enough, the grid gets very, very small and you find lots of solutions, right? So what you do is you first try this for K equals zero then you can maybe prove that there aren't any solutions. Then you try it for k equals one, k equals two, k equals three, right? When you get to k equals 2000, and, sorry, when you get to k equals uh, 501, let's say for every k up to 500, you were able to show that there was no solution. Like there weren't actually any grid points in that meniscus. And then when you get to k equals 501, you suddenly find a solution then you know that's the smallest possible t count. But then after you do that, after you found your u in the, in the region, then you also have to solve the Diophantine equation. Sometimes that fails. You, you may not be able to solve it and you may not be able to prove that it doesn't have a solution, right? If the right-hand side will end up being this, and that may or may not be prime, right? And you may or may, may or may not be able to factor it. So then, because the second step can fail, sometimes you have to move on to the next U in this grid, and the next U and the next U. But as long as your K didn't go up from K to K plus one, then they will all have the same T count. So if you can find one, then you know that you found the optimal T count. If not, you go to K plus one, but then you know the optimal T count you know, a K is definitely a lower bound, right? And you find an upper bound because you find the operator. Does that answer it? Um, well, I think, uh, I think it answers it 
for me, certainly, and uh, I hope also the uh, Apoya says yes uh, on the chat. So maybe we can, in the interest of time, uh, just take one more question and then uh, and then we'll give Peter a break. By the um, way, you the operator up to 10 to the minus 1,000. Wow. <laughs> and it took, I, unfortunately, I didn't time it, but probably a minute or so. so so there's several questions from the chat, but maybe somebody bold can just ask their question uh, by unmuting and, and then... Uh... Yeah, you don't have to use the chat. You can just talk. Sure. Uh, hi, uh, it's Marcus uh, Edwards from IQC here. I had a question if this uh, algorithm was associated or being used by any particular compiler technology or any practical application in quantum computing. I think everyone is using it. Everyone, okay. Uh, all the, so we have it as a library. Um, well, it's written in Haskell, so it's probably not always so easy to, to um, incorporate it into every possible sort of software. But yeah, all, all those, I mean, it's just much better than the, than the um, Solovic Kitayev thing, right? So, so when people actually do have to compile, say, small rotations, I think they would be using this algorithm. Okay, thanks. And and the, this is for Clifford plus T, and you know this was done in 2012, 2013, 14-ish. Um, this has also been done uh, since then for many other gate sets, right? Clifford plus V, and and you get, there's many versions of this sub, sort of work for different. Uh, it doesn't work for all gate sets, but it works for the interesting ones. And this took 74 seconds just now. Um, okay, well, um, thank you so much, Peter. I mean, I, it's just absolutely amazing uh, results. And, uh, you know, it's neat to see the, uh, the code in practice. So maybe I will, um, at this point, uh, you know, we usually uh, end the talk, and then we will have uh, the virtual grad house where people can kind of hang out and ask if they like ask more questions in a casual environment or just hang out and. Okay and have some snacks or, or something. So I'm going to stop the recording and, and we can all